My name is Tom Harkis. I'm one of the pastors here at Crossway. I'm glad you could join us this morning. And I just to go ahead and just give context to the team that went to Colorado. Some of you may not know that we're part of a larger network of churches called Crossway Chapels. Um, there's been at various stages, uh, some that are incubating as a church plant and some who were birthed over 25 years ago, 20, yeah, 25 plus years ago. Um, and there's been 32 of them. And again, we, um, so six of them, including the church plant that's uh, going to be starting this year in Greeley, are in Colorado. So they went out to these sister churches that are crossways that are um, very much like Crossway Fox Valley. And that's who they were fellowshipping with. That gives you a little bit of a context on that. Before we jump back into the book of Mark, I want to just take a moment. I, I, I so appreciated one of the gentlemen here in our body, um, uh, Nate Cox, who, who sa said, you know, uh, you know, Tom, just would you qualify in context the message of, of how does last week's message pertain to when things are abused or abuse? And, and last week we looked in the book of Mark as we're going through the book of Mark of God's design of what he desires for us in the kingdom in the midst of of the book of Mark, of looking at who Jesus genuinely is and what does it mean to have true faith in Jesus. And, and, then, and then what he does is it, it culminates there through chapters 8 and 9 about of who he is as the Christ, as the Son of God. And then what does it mean to follow him as those who have been, who lose our lives for his sake in the Gospels, who believe and, and trust in Christ. And what he does, he interdisperses throughout the book these teachings on kingdom living. There's 12 different references through the book of Mark on kingdom. And, and then as we see also this mission mandate that flows 11 specific passages talking about being those who are part of this kingdom advancement, making disciples. And one of those things he talks about in the kingdom is marriage. And we looked at last week is that God's heartbeat, as we see in scripture in Mark chapter 10, if you have a Bible, go ahead and join at me there. But in Mark chapter 10, we, we jumped back. We had already gone ahead a little bit and Glenn had brought us through most of Mark 10 and we jumped back to Mark 10, one through uh, or 10 or so, those verses on marriage. And we talked about how God's design in marriage is that there would be a, a commitment of a covenant relationship that would reflect our relationship with him and that relationship would be un inseparable. And there would be two allowances for a breaking of that covenant relationship and that having to do with uh, unrepentant adultery and the other one, the abandonment of the non-believer. And the only thing I would just, just to qualify that, and I think Nate brought this up, is that you know, what in the case of danger or abuse, you know, physical danger on the part of, the, of a spouse or the children, and we would counsel them to separate for a season as we've done this historically, um, we have never counseled toward divorce, and by God's grace, uh, we have seen God reconcile marriages, and so we rejoice in that. Um, but there are situations that do arise because of endangerment or, or, or a physical abuse or uh, based on uh, knowing that couple and, and counseling with them that we might encourage them to separate for a season with a desire then to reconcile. So just to qualify that, because that was a question that was brought up last week. <sighs> All right, so we're ready to jump back into the book of Mark. I want you to, if you have a Bible again, look at me in Mark chapter 10, and we're going to be looking at a passage that's going to be touching, I believe, all of our lives. But before I do that, I'm going to ask you to turn to someone near you and share what do you remember outside of what I just shared about the book of Mark? So someone near you, if you're here for the first time or you haven't been in the book of Mark, just kind of listen up as people around you. But what do you remember from the book of Mark? I'm going to give you 60 seconds. Okay, go ahead and do that. All right, let me, let me pull it back together. <clears throat> I'm so grateful how God works uh, through his Holy Spirit and his people, specifically through his word, could continue to, to grow us, each of us in our lives. This past week, the main idea of this message God brought home to me in my heart in a very specific way that I, I just bless him for um, it involved a, a brother who I've known for 11 years. He's, not, he's a brother in Christ. He's not a blood brother, but he's a believer I've known, and he's another leader I've known for 11 years. And, and he, he, in rather detail accounting, shared with me a, a blind spot, uh, or blind spots, I should say, in my life, that I've hurt him inadvertently. And, and, and interesting enough, because I was praying that the day before specifically that God would apply this principle in my life and God so wonderfully and graciously brought this to bear the next day. That this was an area that God had really desired for me to look at in my own life. And, 
But I, I, I submit to you, it is actually going to touch all of our lives, every single person here. And it has to do with this main idea, and I've even purposely put it on, on, on a piece of cardboard because you'll understand this, is that greatness is found in selfless service, in selfless service. Because one of the things that, that Jesus does as he's teaching his disciples about what does it mean to really follow him is that he helps them understand that this kingdom aspect as he's teaching them about marriage and now he's going to go to talk about leadership in the church, but then even in a broader sense for all believers dealing with the issue of pride and how it, it hinders us and undermines our relationship with people. It becomes an obstacle also in our relationship with God and it thwarts God's grace and work among us. Earlier in the week, as I was reflecting on the passage and meditating on this, this principle, as we will see in the book of Mark about this greatness is found in selfless service, I was asking the Lord, is it where in my life, Lord, has, have I promoted myself? You know, where is it that, Lord, in my own heart, where self has gotten in the way, where there's recognition sought or there's exaltation in, in some way in my life. And, and I asked, I said, Lord, whatever residual is part of my life through my, the flesh that somehow manifests itself, I said, Lord, would you root it out of me? Would you just take it away? And that there would just be this selfless abandonment of loving God and loving people around me that would be accompanied by his grace, his hand in my life. And then I got that email the next day in rather detail, again, a, a rather lengthy email of how I had hurt this brother. And it was um, some of it was clearly a blind spot in my life that I did not see that the Lord really wanted to put a spotlight on and to show me how desperately in need of him I am. And the, the coolest thing about this and, and how it's part of the crossway culture is that how we forgive one another. Um, and and there's, a, there's even a saying is amongst leaders is that we, we want to be close enough to, that we actually hurt each other. You, oh no, is this what I, I'm, I'm here to get hurt? No, it's just that just doing life close enough as leaders, we know that there's going to be things in our life that as we rub up against each other, those areas of our lives that God's saying, you know, Tom, I, um, I want you to grow here. I want you to continue to become more like me. And so there's this transparency and this openness. And so I, this brother was so gracious to forgive me after I, I went through and specifically asked his forgiveness on each one of those things that, that he brought to bear on my life, and so wonderfully, and I feel actually closer to him now than I did before the phone call yesterday that followed up the email. And I think as we, we consider this main idea of that greatness um, is, is found in selfless service, if we, if we don't grab hold of that, there's a real downside to it. And, it. and I think there's a couple ways you'll see this. Number one is you'll see this very practically in your everyday relationships in your everyday relationships. Because if you fail to grasp this, you'll think that actually greatness is found in you. And what that does is then you think that everyone around you has to, to go ahead and line up and comply with that to fulfill that life is really about you. And you know what that leads to is very unhappy people around you, doesn't it? Is it because it becomes a real selfish thing? You're you know, defensive and you're you're self-serving, and life can be that way. And it's almost like even as believers, we can recognize that and feel like it, that somehow it's, it's so close to us and we, we can't seem to separate, almost like it's barnacled to us, you know, that, 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 and we say, Lord, would you set us free from this? And, and then we're comforted with hope of the gospel of what Christ does and the promise of the gospel as we not simply believe in it for salvation, but daily apply it in our lives as those who are dead to sin, dead to that selfishness, and alive in Christ Jesus, that hope every day we can apply. So by way of application is that number one, just you ask, well, why might this be important? Is that, and how might God speak to us on this message? Why is it, where does it intersect life? It's just unhealthy relationships. And then also, I think a failure to grasp this will also lead to a drivenness to, 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 to fulfill what you think life is to be for you. It's this drivenness. You'll find yourself this controlling aspect is you're driven to control your world because it's about you and you're trying to control you, the circumstances or the people around you to fulfill your self goals. This is your selfdom, your kingdom that you think life is about. And so you wind yourself controlling people around you and, and trying to control circumstances. And when things don't work out, you get very anxious and you get very depressed. It's a symptom of that, that you need to really embrace what God has to say to you here. What this main truth of what God's talking to us about is, and then lastly, I think also it minimizes fruitfulness. 
you'll find yourself is that you, as you look at over your life is you just won't see much fruit that God's using you and you won't see many people come to Christ. You won't see your, your light being able to impact others. You won't see a ministry of discipleship of people around you because you're so self-absorbed. And, and I know in my own life, I can find myself this way. And so I'm so grateful for the Lord Jesus that he speaks to this. And it's needed, it's absolutely needed for each one of us here. And not surprising because it was really needed for the early disciples as well. It's, it's fascinating, as you're reading through the book of Mark, you'll, re, you'll realize in chapter nine, this, this is not new. In chapter nine, he's already dealt with this because they were arguing one chapter before this. They're arguing about who's the greatest in the kingdom. So here are these 12. They've spent almost well, three plus years with Jesus He's, he's just told them in the context that I'm going to lay my life down for you. I'm going to die for you. He's told them for the third time, I'm going to be crucified. And right on the heels of that passage, Mark documents that they're arguing about is that here the sons of Zebedee come to J James and John. It's actually the other account tells them that their mother goes first to tell Jesus. Something wrong with that picture, by the way. If you're sending your mom ahead of you, I mean, or you're letting your mom go ahead of you to appeal, to say, who's going to sit on my left, Jesus' left or right in the kingdom? They want this place of honor. Something inherently wrong with that. But here they are, they're arguing about that. And then within, within 24 to 72 hours, we see at the Last Supper, when Jesus is with his disciples, this last moment is that Jesus is telling him, and he says, this is the, my body that is to be delivered up to you. The, the wine is to reflect my, the blood that is to be shed for you, this new covenant. And it, the next phrase is they're arguing about who's the greatest in the kingdom. And you're kind of going, like, come on. And then you go, wait a minute. What about me? You feel like they're, they're, they're so blinded to that their pride has such this impact. And you, there's a reason why God inspired Mark to document this, these so grouped together, so importantly throughout the book of Mark, as you see, having talked about who Jesus is and what it means to truly know him, true faith, and then what it means to truly follow him, it's not surprising that he would talk about this, that true greatness is, is found in the selfless service in the kingdom of God, starting with those immediately around us and a part of God's great story and then those that he brings into our lives. And so with that is, is how does God speak to this tension of these unhealthy relationships or this drivenness to control our world? And, which, by the way, is exhausting because it often comes with this collateral damage in our own lives. It's just exhausting as we're trying to control people in our circumstances. And, and then this, we see then this minimal amount of fruitfulness in God's kingdom. And so how does God speak to this? In Mark chapter 10, he says this. Again, having in verses 32 through 34, he, again, for the third time, actually, what I, I've seen actually in the fourth time, because I, I see that there's another allusion to it as well in, the, in through the book of Mark, that he tells them that the Son of Man must be delivered up to the chief priests, speaking of himself, and will be condemned to death and delivered over to the Gentiles, and they'll mock him and spit at him, flog him and kill him, and in three days he will rise. And then verse 35, our text. And James and John and the sons of Zebedee, now we know from the other account of this in the book of Matthew, again, is that the mother has preceded them. Their mom has already gone to Jesus and asked, hey, can my son sit on either side of you when you go into your glory and your kingdom? It, and this is referring to a day in the future when Jesus will establish his earthly kingdom, the new heaven and the new earth on this, a new earth. And, uh, this is 1.0. There's a big 2.0 coming. When he establishes the second earth, as it is, a new earth, as he establishes his kingdom on earth, is they're referring to that time. And, and they, Jesus has spoken of that, and so they're saying, well, they're trying to vie for position and prominence, and so Zebedee's, the sons of Zebedee, the, their mother goes to them and says, Jesus, can, can James and John sit at your left and right? And, and then the counting here is it didn't end with the mother's appeal, but also James and John themselves said, and so James and John the sons of Zebedee came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. <laughs> Which is, I think, is a kind of an interesting request, isn't it? I mean, some of us would say, well, that's kind of audacious or, you know, arrogant on their part, a little presumptuous. You know, Jesus, do whatever we want you to do. We're not going to tell you quite yet, but we want you to do whatever we ask you to do. Would you agree with that first? And you almost get this sense that they're setting Jesus up. And so Jesus responds rather wisely as God the Son, right? He says this, Jesus, 
He says, responds this way. He said to them, what do you want me to do for you? That's an important question, right? And they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. That's how we want Jesus. That's all we're asking of you is that when you come into your glory in your kingdom, that James and, John, James and I, James and John are speaking, that one's on your left and one's on your right. That's all we're asking, Jesus. And so what does Jesus do? What does he say to them? He responds this way. I, I love his patience because, you know, there's part of me, you know, I would be tempted if I was Jesus, like, are you kidding me? Like, 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 what are you asking? You're so arrogant and we just dealt with this and oh my goodness, you're dealing with, I mean, that would be my temptation, but notice how God the Son responds so patiently. He says to his disciples, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized? Now, what Jesus is referring to is his suffering that's ahead. And in scripture, we see this is that often, and we'll see this in the account of the, in Gethsemane later in, in the book of Luke, is that he refers to this time of suffering and Jesus is, is there before the Father knowing that the crucifixion is, is going to be imminent that he'll be delivered up and betrayed. And so he says, Father, would you allow this cup, this cup of suffering, speaking of his flogging and what's ahead of him, the mocking and the beating, and then finally the crucifixion, would you allow this cup to pass from me? And he's in this agony and this humanness of knowing what awaits him and the mockery and being separated from the Father when he takes all our sins upon himself. And, and so he says, Lord, would you allow this cup to pass from me? And then he's, you see this example of Jesus, but not my will, but what? Thy will be done, right? And so he willingly submits to that. And so he's referring to this cup of suffering and persecution and trials as he's talking to his disciples because all but one of them will die martyrs' deaths from what we understand from church history. John, who was tortured and from what I've read is boiled in oil but escaped alive but died in the island of Patmos in exile, in the middle of the Mediterranean. And that's where we, God inspired him to write the book of Revelation. But outside of that, even you, you understand that all of them, actually including John, will suffer greatly for the gospel. And so he says to them, he asks the question, are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized or united with, with that which I am baptized? So again, he's speaking of baptism is to be united with when we when the people come to Christ, they are baptized into water. They're united into water. It's this union, a picture of union with Christ, his death and his resurrection. And so he's speaking here of this, are you be willing to drink of that same cup? Are you willing to experience that, to be united with that suffering that I've been, I have suffered? And they said rather, I think I, rather foolishly and, 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 and hastily, we're able I mean, they're still thinking, you know, I'm going to recognition at your left and right. We're able, God, we can do this. And he says, the cup that I drink, notice how Jesus re responds. The cup that I drink, you will drink. Speaking of the suffering that they will endure. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand and my left hand is not mine to grant, but is for those from whom it has been prepared. So in God's plan and his scheme. We know that there are places of unique leadership that God has. We know that, for example, King David will have a unique place in God's kingdom. And for what God has prepared, speaking of the Father, God the Father, that he says, that's not for my to determine. That's already been determined. It's for those whom had has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant or angry at James and John. Now, now you can imagine you know, the, here they are, is they're, they're part of the group. They've been hanging out with James and John for these three years approximately. And then they see them, that their mother went first, asked Jesus, can James and John sit at your left and right? Then they're asking Jesus, can we sit at your left and right? And you're like, my goodness, look what these folks are doing. And they, they felt angry in part, I think, because they felt like they were trying to get the inside track on, the, on prominence for the kingdom. But it wasn't because that they were so humble, because we know in a few hours, they're going to be arguing still about what? Who's 
the greatest. It's almost like, well, they, they took a, the opportunity to, uh, took advantage of an opportunity. They sent their mother ahead to ask Jesus, and then here they are, some of the closest of the inner circle with Jesus, and they're asking for this prominence and this place of prominence, and so they're in, indignant. And so what Jesus does then is he, he helps underscore what real greatness is for the kingdom. He says this, verse 42, and Jesus called them to him and he said to them, so you can just see they're arguing and Jesus knows and he just pulls them close to him. He says, come here. And he says, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles in the context of of really of non-believers, but Gentiles, he says they lord it over. Robertson, A.T. Robertson, who's a Greek scholar, it it has a sense there of, of more of a tyrannical type of control. It's this oppressive type of thing, and that, that's the sense he's bringing out. He says, um, he says, they lord it over them, and the great ones exercise authority over them. But, verse 43, it shall not be so among you. So here again, he's talking about what it means to be a kingdom citizen. What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? What to have true faith in the true Jesus? What's it going to look like when it comes to leadership? What's it going to look like in your interactions with one another? He says, if you want to be great, he says, notice, he says, but it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you shall be your servant or your slave. He uses this analogy of master servant. And whoever would be first among you shall be a slave of all. For even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And so see, this beautiful picture, what he's saying, he's driving home this fundamental value, a Jesus value, in that Jesus' scheme of things is that God's greatness is found not in exalting ourselves, not in lording over, not in this position of prominence and recognition, but in this selflessness that we lose ourselves and our love for other people, our love for others and being part of God's great story and great work. It's this selflessness that God calls us to, this humble, selfless service, that greatness is found in God's kingdom in selfless service, in this giving of ourselves to the Lord. Now, in the context, we could see that you can make an argument, this is really a qualification for leadership, right? But really, it's a qualification for all of us. It's a qualification for all of us, for, for all of us deal with the, this desire to promote or self-exaltation. So there's two simple points, and the first one is simply this, is that pride makes fools of us all. Pride makes fools of us all. What does that really mean? What is he, what, why am I saying that? Because as you're reading through the book of Mark, that one of the things you realize is you go, come on, guys. I'm here, Jesus is just talking about for the third or fourth time that he's gonna be crucified. He's, gonna, he's laying his life down. And then you're turning around and you're arguing about who's the greatest in the kingdom or vying for this position of prominence or recognition. And you're kind of going, man, that is just so foolish. And, you, and then again, within 12, 24 to 72 hours, they're going to do the same thing at one of the most intimate times, Jesus' last time with his disciples, before he's betrayed, this last meal with them, the last supper. And again, what are they doing? Arguing about who's the greatest. And you kind of go, man, you guys are so foolish. And then you go, oh, wait a minute. What about what? What about me? as that pride has this capacity to, to blind us and it makes fools of us all. And we see this from the very beginning with our first parents in the garden that we're, we see in Genesis chapter three is that Satan tempts Eve and what, what he does with Eve is he says, if you, you take of the fruit, you'll be like what? God. It's this desire to elevate, to ex- exalt ourselves. We see in, in the book of Isaiah Chapter 14 is one of the first occasions where sin is documented where speaking of this cherub, speaking, I believe, of Satan in, in Isaiah 14, that he wanted to elevate himself up to God. He wanted to be lifted up. Although brilliant and magnificent angel and uh, arguably one of the most beautiful beings that were ever created, and yet instead of being thankful, he desired to be elevated. Isaiah chapter 14, we see that pride enters in. You see examples all through scripture. We see this in 1 Samuel as well in chapter 15 where Saul is, is the king. He's the first king of Israel. Um, he was supposed to be heads taller than the rest. He was a big, good-looking guy. And, 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 and yet we see how pride 
skews his perspective and God had given him a very specific command to kill all of those wicked, these wicked people that were under the judgment of God. And so what is, is that Saul does is he, he doesn't kill the king of, of those people that were under God's judgment. And so interesting enough is the prophet comes before Saul and says, Saul, did you obey God? And he says, yeah, I obeyed God. I was supposed to kill all the Malachites to prove it I brought one back alive. Now, does anybody see like there's a miss somewhere in there, right? There's something happening. You know, you're to kill all the Malachites. I obeyed God just to prove it. I brought one back alive. And you're like, wait a minute, what's missing? And, and I would submit to you that that's not just for people in the scriptures. It's for all of us. Is that pride has this capacity to blind us, to make fools of us all. You know, there's a song that... that uh, I've got a kick out of. I'm, I'm not a big country western fan. Um, I, I used to live in Colorado, um, and country western is a little bit more prevalent there. And I remember when I was there, I, I heard this song by Toby Keith. Uh, maybe some of you have heard it. It, it's, it goes, I want to talk about me. Every once in a while, I want to talk about me. want to talk about I. want to talk about number one, me, oh my. It is in contrast to his, the woman he's with. That, you know, she's always talking about herself. And he says, but every once in a while, I want to talk about me. And, and I think it's a great, it really could be the anthem of our countries, uh, the, really the national anthem, you could say, the national song. Because it, so much of everything, whether you're, I'm ministering to somebody who's homeless, who has nothing, or somebody, or the more rich, wealthiest people in the country that I may have an opportunity to meet or interact with, is that we all deal with this commonality of this pride that blinds us. And it makes fools of us all left to ourselves. It makes fools of us all. I just think about how often in my life, if I'm having tension in my relationship with my wife, Dawn, or, or I'm frustrated with, with my children, and, and I just get back to, like, why am I asking myself the question? like, why am I feeling this way? And, and it's, well, somehow I, I've grabbed hold of something, a, a misperceived right that I, I never had in the beginning to, for life to be happy and hassle-free and, as if that's a right that any of us have. And then whenever something enters into that and disrupts my happy life that's peaceful and hassle-free, then I get upset. Pride makes fools of us, what? Oh. Let me give a second principle. Not, not only does pride makes fools of us all, but also the world's value system is upside down and God writes goes ahead and he right sides up it, if I can make that a verb, is that what he does is he, God is, is right side up. He, he takes the world's value system that's upside down while God is right side up. And what he does is he helps us understand, no, no, we've got it backwards. You want to be great, he says, then you be last. You want to be first, you be a servant of all. So again, back to the text in verse 41, he, he's underscoring this again for his disciples. He drives the truth home where he says this to them. He says, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them this tyrannical rule or control. And he says, and their great ones exercise authority. Again, it's this, this heavy handedness. But it shall not be so among you. In other words, are those who, he says, who wish to be great, he said, among you must be servants of all. And whoever be first among you must be a slave of all. For even then speaking of his own example, the son of man, speaking of himself, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Speaking of the payment that would be made that he would lay down his life for us. And so Jesus uses himself as an example. He points to himself and he calls them to say, look at even my life, even the God of the universe, the, the God who be who created everything as if we became like an amoeba, a single cell type of animal or simple celled animal, is that we, he said, I became human to serve and lay my life down for you. And so he says this, he says, I want you to be ones that recognize that this, this, this call to a different lifestyle, a different value system, a Jesus values. He says, I want you to, to give yourself away. I want you to live not to be served, but to serve and give a life for ransom. And so he's driving this principle home. These are those who are going to lead the church in the future. They will be those who help people understand what does it mean to follow Christ? And it's not just for them, but it was for the whole church. There were to be people that we see throughout the book of the scriptures and the epistles, this call to humility, this call 
to, to give our lives away to consider others more important than ourselves. We see it in the book of Philippians chapter 2 where he says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than yourself. And then do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. So it's this call to say, I'm not going to be motivated by self. Even though it seems to almost barnacle itself around me and I, I seem to be enchained in this self-preoccupation and self-focus. And he says, I want you to give your life away. I, I want you to consider others more important. I want you to have this radical other-centeredness that comes in walking with Jesus. I want you to have this other-centeredness that reflects a kingdom value of having true faith in the true Savior what it means to truly follow him. In James chapter four, it helps us understand how this pride is, is source of all the quarrels. He says this in James chapter four, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly with wrong motives to spend it on your passions or your pleasures. Verse four, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world, its world system, this is enmity or puts you at odds with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is no purpose that the scripture says? And he quotes, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, end quotes. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And then he gives us this prescriptive way to, to, to get there. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. Draw near to God. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. And so here we see this call that this is, as believers, we recognize that when there's source of tension and problems within us, it goes back to this fundamental issue of pride in our hearts. If there's tension in marriage, where does it go back to? Pride. If there's issues in relationships of those around us and siblings and, and issues with neighbors, it goes back to pride. Is this the source of all these problems? And God says, here's the remedy. I want you to humble yourself before me. I want you to clothe yourselves with humility. He talks about specifically leaders in 1 Peter chapter 5 where he says, leaders, he says, I want you to, to clothe yourself with humility one to another. And he, leaders, I want you to be an example. I don't want you to lord over them, but prove to be an example, gentle among them proving to be an example. It's this very different priority system. It's, it's the way up is the way down. It's God's right side up as he helps us understand what that really looks like to submit to God and to follow him. What does this practically look like as leaders? What does it mean for us to be ones that are motivated out of a love for others? And what does it mean for all believers as us to reflect this selflessness in our lives? Well, let me submit a couple of things. Paul Tripp uh, ha has this list of, of things that characterize, let me submit to you, is this aspect of selfless service. Is, let me give you a few of these. He says, willing to self-sacrifice for the good of another that does not require reciprocation or that the person being loved is deserving. I want you to just think about your own life as, you, as we go, go through this list. Being willing to have your life complicated by the needs and struggles of others without impatience or anger. What about, us about selfless service? It's actively fighting the temptation to be critical and judgmental toward another while looking for ways to encourage and praise. What about selfless service of making a daily commitment to resist the needless moments of conflict that come from pointing out and responding to minor offenses? What about being lovely, honest, and humbly approachable in times of misunderstanding. And then when some people come to us, that we not defend ourselves. You know, I, I've just reminded myself, um, as, as I got the letter, he said, Tom, I, I want to talk to you face to face. This brother was in another state, lives in another state. He's a leader there. And, and, um, and he said, but, but I thought maybe I could write it out and then we could talk o over the phone, you know, over Face or uh, FaceTime or Skype or over the phone. And, and so he sent it to me. And, and one of the things I prayed is I read a rather lengthy letter rather detailed accounting of, of my offenses, is that one of the things I had to get to when I, I got done with it, I said, you know, the reality is he doesn't know the half of it that's really going on here in my life. 
He didn't even know the half of it. He didn't even know 10% of the issues that I deal with. So why should I react if he happens to point out 10%? Even if it's not always accurate. And God may see it a little differently, some of those things. But the reality is he doesn't see half of it. So why am I defensive? Why, Why don't I just embrace it? as something that God has sent to make me more like himself and make me more fruitful. Why do I defend myself? Why don't I just embrace it and and hear it and come forth more like Jesus through the process? Selfless service and this humility is being more committed to unity and understanding than, than you're winning or accusing or being right. Making a daily commitment to admit your sin and weakness and failure and to resist the temptation to offer an excuse or to shift the blame. Or be willing when confronted by another to examine your heart rather than rising to your defense or shifting the focus. How often, you know, when when someone comes to me, I'm tempted to, um, to, to go ahead and discredit them in my own heart because of all the things that I know about them that I feel like they're not quite reaching the standard that I think they should have or cutting the mustard as it were. And God's saying, no, I... Lose yourself. This, it, it, you're, it's about me and my kingdom. There's joy and fruitfulness in that selflessness. Give your life away. Lose your life for my sake in the gospels. It's not about you. And I've had to remind myself time and time again, Tom, it's not about you. It's not about you. And there is great freedom, man, because that's a hard yoke to carry, isn't it? When we forget and we think it's about us and we defend ourselves or we have to be right or we have to control things or control our spouse or people around us and we have to make them act this way or make it work out this way or never get to a place where we humble ourselves and ask forgiveness, man, that is exhausting. It's exhausting. Instead of just, Tom, just humble yourself before the Lord. Submit to him. God is all over this. Let God's grace just pour over you. Let the gospel reach down and deep roots into your heart in this situation. There's great freedom there and trust that God is working and moving for his glory. Selfless service is being unwilling to do what is wrong when you're, when you're being wronged, but looking for concrete and specific ways to, become, to overcome evil with good. Being a good student of another, looking for their physical, emotional, and spiritual needs so that in some way you can remove the burden, support them as they carry it, or encourage them along the way. You get a sense what God's talking about here, right? Being willing to ask for forgiveness and always being committed to grant forgiveness. You know, one of the things I love, have loved about serving with the elders, of, and, and the most recently Glenn's joined us, but for both Glenn and particularly Clark over the last few years as I've had a chance to serve along Clark, is Clark has been so gracious in forgiveness. I have never, as, as there are times I've had to, to more, more, more than once, <laughs> I've had to ask Clark's forgiveness and he has been so gracious. I've never sensed he's ever held it over me, not one little iota. He's always forgiven me and forgotten it. And this is part of our, 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 the culture, the crossway culture, right? That we're committed to, that we guard and we argue, for, we, we fight for to maintain. And, and, and it, it's something that, yeah, that we are be, be ones that by God's grace we'll see in the future played out in our lives. And so what are some of the obstacles that hinder this? What, what are some obstacles that hinder this being ones that experience the reality of this? Let me submit a couple obstacles to you. One is just misplaced identities, misplaced identity is that you have put your identity in a place that God says that's not you. And, and you see this a lot, and I was talking to my, my daughter about this, the message, and I was saying, Erica, like, what does this look like for young people and youth? And, and we were talking about social media and how through social media you portray something about yourself. You try to portray through a, a certain image of yourself. And where that's really rooted, in my, it, it's, such, it's such a tragic thing, and we see uh, mental illness and, and, and anxiety and and uh, suicide going way up with, with social media. Historically now, as we look at trends, we see that it is spiking. And, and that's, that's linked a lot to social media. And so in that is there's this portrayal of your, to portray yourself a certain way to people. Now, it's always been the case. It's just social media allows it to be it, it concentrated in, in a real high dosage of it. And instead of being ones that, wait a minute, I, I want to lose myself and my love for other people. And so even as I post or selfie, you know, whatever it is in life, is I'm thinking, wait a minute, what, what am I communicating and why am I posting this? 
You know, what, what motivates me? Is this the selflessness about my life and, or is it because I want a grandstand or I want to you know, promote myself in some way, shape, or form? And so misplaced identity. You know, God says that he has made me as a child of his. And, and I was just meditating this week on a quote. I think it was from John Piper. And, and the quote was this, is that, you know, Tom, it's just that the gospel, just meditating on the truth of the gospel is that I could be a, a hundred times worse than I am on my worst day. And the gospel would still cover all of that. That God would still love me just as much just to, to meditate on the truth of the gospel. And if I know that, if I'm a child of God, that the greatest being that has ever been, that ever will be, the God of the universe, loves me that much, then why am I worried about these other folks? Why am I trying to prove myself in these other areas? Man, I'm all, I'm all filled up. I shouldn't have to go look for, like, you know, affirmation or, or validation from people or my spouse. And even though I want that and I want everyone to think I'm wonderful and all those kind of things, but you know, the reality is I shouldn't need it. It shouldn't motivate me and drive me to action or to pull away as much as I would want that at times. And I think another obstacle is our backgrounds, that, that we've been trained to think that it's about us or raised that, that we're the center of the universe. And I mean, for me, it was an epiphany in college. I came to Christ as a college student. And, and I remember just realizing as I read through the word of God that actually I'm not the center of the universe. It would, I mean, literally, it would say that God would work for his namesake or he'll answer your prayer for his namesake. And I used to go, well, why doesn't it say for my namesake? Because I'm the one that's getting the answered prayer. And I start to realize this pattern through scripture is that it really boils back to him, who he is. It's for his namesake. It's for his glory he works in our life. And, and the joy of that is that it's in that, in, in our yielded to him, is that our joy is fulfilled and maxed out. And he wants us to have that joy. But it's not found in us. It's found in serving him, right? It's in his glory. It's in his work in our lives. And so what's the hope? The hope is this, and I praise God for it, is that is that as I think about my own life and I think about my, this main idea that greatness is found in, in selfless service, I know at times that my service is not so selfless. I know sometimes there's a catch. I know sometimes there's an agenda that I have. And as I recognize that, instead of just beating myself, saying, Tom, you smuck, you know, you dirtbag, you, all those things may be true. But the reality is, you know what? is that I'm a child of the kings. And, and today, yes, I look at this sin and I own it, but you know what? I, I was able to walk away from that, that, that opportunity to get reconciled with that brother, that yes, I felt saddened by how I'd hurt him. I did, genuinely, I'd hurt him. And I told him that and I, and I was saddened. But you know, once we got reconciled and we applied the gospel to each other, you know what? I just felt such a joy and a lightening of the load that I was reconciled to a brother, that I'd hurt, genuinely hurt. And, and the, the, the joy that, and the hope that we have in the gospel is that tomorrow I can be different than I am today. I can, I can go with having been raised in a very difficult uh, family with difficult marriage, and, and I had ne- up until coming to Christ, I had never seen a good marriage. Never. All my friends, I thought, oh, man, your, fa- your parents, man, you guys have got such a great marriage. Oh, my folks, no, no, no. My folks fight all the time. They're getting divorced. I'm like, who? I remember leading up to, to my going to college, I, had, I was very pessimistic. I didn't want to marry until I was in my 30s, if I ever got married. And then coming to Christ, realizing what God did is that there was such hope because we can know that our past doesn't have to define us. Our brokenness doesn't have to define us, but Christ does. And the gospel does is that I'm new and I can walk in newness of life. And so what, is this, what does this mean for us? What does God want you to do with the message? So let me ask you the question when we think about this. Pride makes fools of us all and the world's value system is upside down while God's is right side up. This, this first, you want to be first, be last, this whole selfless service. Is, what does God want you to do with this? How does this intersect your life this morning? What's God saying specifically to you today? I want you to think about that. Maybe some of you, you know, you're, you're tempted to kind of elbow your spouse or elbow the person you drove with because you all had words coming over. And you're, you're kind of going, boy, I hope they heard this. You know, it's like, I hope they're hearing this. Let me get all the reflection right on them. Um, and then at the same time, what God is doing, he's, he's saying, no, no, it's actually, I'm trying to work on, on you, on you. And this quick to forgive and to understand that we're all broken apart from Christ. We all are desperately needy. 
There's the humility that we all have. The, the, gr- the ground before the cross is all level. It's all level. There's no high points for us, two people to stand on. The rest of us are minions. But no, we all humbly submit to God. We're all desperate. And so then the question lastly is, what might God do in our church body if we embrace this truth? What might God do in our, our church body? Starting with our, our most intimate relationships of, of maybe for some of you that might be married or for, with roommates that you might live with. What might God do if you humbly embrace this and say, God, would you bring this in truth into my heart and my life and that God that I know that greatness is in your kingdom is found in selfless service. But what would my relationships look like with my roommates for those of you who are college students? Or for those of you who are married for, with my spouse? How might it affect those I work with? And what might God, how might God use us in, in the kingdom work that we're involved in? And so let's, uh, let me invite you to just take a moment of silence with me. And just, would you bow your heads? As we think about Jesus' values, as we're going to go in the Lord's Supper is an opportunity to respond. It's, Whenever the scriptures open it for God's people, the scriptures in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 tells us the word of God does its work in those who believe. Not surprising when he calls people to himself, he says, whoever wishes to find his life shall lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel shall find it. For what did it profit a man if they gain the whole world and lose their soul? It's a call to genuine relationship with Christ, to believe. And it's all anchored on the, on the cross where we see the Son of Man, Jesus beaten, mocked, abandoned, ridiculed, betrayed, spat upon, and then impaled in a torturous cross where he felt every blow. His, he was bruised, his body bruised just like ours. He felt every slap, every lash that laid open his back. And as he hung there on the cross, they mocked him and they said, oh, he says he's the son of God. Why don't you come down from the cross if you're the son of God? If you're the Messiah. And the irony of it is because he was God the Son, he stayed there because he had us in mind. But he who knew no sin became our sin. That through a miracle of faith that we would become his righteousness. And so the night that he was betrayed, he took the cup and the bread. And he says, I want you to enter into this covenant, and this, a covenant for all of God's people throughout time since that night, that when we take the cup and we take the bread, we remember his blood that was shed and his body that was broken for us. It was pierced through for our sins that he would bring us to God. This is for believers, those who have come to know him, and it, we're to be ones that enter into this with gratitude and worship and to say, Lord, thank you so much for what you've done. that we take a moment and, Lord, is there any way I've been inconsistent that in my own pride I forgot it, that it's not about me. And so I invite you to confess between you and the Lord anything. That just Scripture says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us. And so let me invite you just to simply between you and the Lord to experience his cleansing power afresh and anew to affirm what he's already done in forgiveness that he's granted on the cross.